In a previous contemplation, the word sin has been used with two types of interpretation. One was the usage of sin as a realm or dimension, and in this case it was even turned into an acronym, standing for simulated interactive nature. Simulated, as it is not truth, interactive because it demands interaction and investment, and nature because it is all-encompassing, completely submerging our minds in itself. The other usage was that of sin as a state of existence. And in this case, the metaphor used was that of a transparent bag, which would be our souls, being colorized by sin dyes external to the bag, that we might allow into the bag or soul, by metaphorically opening it or reacting in certain ways, so as to become infected, so to speak, by the corresponding sin color. These colors, or states of soul, are the true contagions of this realm. But note that, in the same way, transparency, which is no color in the metaphor, that allows light to shine through it unadulterated, is also contagious. Hmm? Should you require recollection of these, or in case you have just stumbled upon this contemplation without any prior contact with this channel, it might be useful to re-listen to the contemplation named Sin and Forgiveness. In any case, the above are the certainly imperfect definitions of sin that were realized from these contemplations into the outlining truth by trying to peel away that which isn't true which are mostly the details around that act as veils. In an attempt to translate the words as faithfully as this your classmate was able to do by using, inevitably, metaphors, analogies and parables. Yet there is a point of view of sin that was not discussed, and that is to look upon sin as do the falsehood minions and those of our truth kin that have aligned with the falsehood and decided to serve it instead. They have skewed the definition of sin away from the identification of the entire realm itself and also away from any tempting contagious states of soul to promote its attachment to the realm of sin and addiction to any aspect or aspects of it. They have turned it into a tool of judgment so as to collectively imbue their priesthoods with the power to offer ritual sacrifice and worship from those of us who would otherwise align with our true connection, or higher self, if that's your preferred wording. And they always do it by the reverse meaning of the titles they confer upon their own priesthoods of this cult of sin. So a cosmology is offered by their priests of physical science, the word science comes from the Latin scientia, which means knowledge. Accepted behavioral regulations are offered by their priests of law. The word law comes from the Old Norse lagu, which meant something that was laid out and worked as a foundation. Biological and medical models are offered by their priests of health. The word health comes from the conjunction of Old Norse heil, which means being whole, sound, and well, and the also Old Norse word helga, which means holy or sacred. Now from these three examples, a mere trio of plenty more that can be observed, we can conclude that they reverse always the product they offer in relation to their priesthood title. So the priests of physical science or knowledge offer physical unknowing or ignorance. The priests of law or foundation offer nothing to stand upon and destabilization, and the priests of health or sacred wholeness offer sickness and disease. And, additionally, and of extreme importance, any deviation observed from the dogmas promoted by the priesthoods of the cult of sin is viewed by them as a sin to their god, which always requires penitence. So a view that deviates from their offered cosmology is viewed by them as a sin of unknowing or ignorance, 
a behavior that deviates from their offered behavior, behavioral regulations is viewed by them as a sin of lawlessness and a view that deviates from their biological and medical models is viewed by them as a sin of illness or disease. What must be understood beforehand is that this collusion and conspiracy is mostly not perpetrated by secret agreement. It is done so by the knowing or unknowing following of centralized orders through some sort of mind and soul parasitical tentacle-like connections. Yes, very Lovecraftian of me to define so. These are individual parasites to which an individual soul knowingly or inadvertently offers allegiance to. This is done, usually involuntarily, by having one's soul opened up by trauma and then identifying one's own volition with that voice speaking words in one's mind. Please refer to the contemplation titled Reincarnation and Ego Death for a car metaphor that may assist in understanding what is being presented here. Now, those individual parasites were defined as tentacle-like because they all link together into a central hive mind. Again, the uh, we are all one meme. There's a contemplation named one too that uh, um, might be useful. And it is actually the cult of sin's god that one of its definitions is having many faces being each of its tentacles a face of a minion it controls, with or without its awareness. In the movie Matrix, for example, anyone linked to the centralized system that remains unawake can be suddenly taken over by an agent, right? In the same manner as an NPC or a minion can receive instructions on how to act based upon the identification with the words being spoken by the voice in their thoughts, which is actually the voice of so-called God. Julian Jaynes, um, the, his book on the bicameral mind, might be a useful read too. Although I do not agree with the resulting conclusions, that is the conclusions of the results, I do find that the outline of his theory shines as, as true when he postulates that the voices of the gods were once clearly identified as external and not confused with being the self. Again, it links back to the outlining principle in the channel of this your classmate. Truth speaks no words, it never does. Now, just for the purpose of clarity, to allow your own contemplation on the subject, let us observe what the modus operandi is in one of these examples. That is, the one of the priests of health that reversely promote disease and ritual worship to their god of the false reality. It is worthy to note at this point a bit of etymological information about a word that synchronistically fell on my lap, so to speak. The Greek word pharmakos, from where pharmacy and pharmacology derive, was the name given to a ritual sacrifice in the Greek religion of old to cast away bad luck and earn the favor of the gods. If not yet to you, this information will become very relevant later on in this presentation. Look up that word. P-H-A-R-M a-K-O-S. Thanks, Tiber, for that timely reference. So, going into our example, the priests of health in the cult of sin have, like any other of their priesthoods, a hierarchy of levels. Those of the lowest levels are seen and treated as mere serfs and dirty labor hands, such as nurses and auxiliary personnel. Then, even among doctors in the priesthood levels are well-defined and awarded, not according to competence in the act of providing health, of course, because, as observed, the meaning of the title is always reversed, but according to competence in the act of using disease as a means of ritual penitence and worship of the re reality's many-faced deity. So, a disease is always openly or in a veiled manner associated with a particular sin, 
judged that way according to certain associated behaviors. You eat fatty meat, then your judgment is what they define as the sin of high cholesterol, and your penitence is to take ritual pills that destroy your health. You have sex, then your judgment is what they define as one of the many sins among a myriad of so-called STDs. You smoke, then your judgment is what they define as the sin of heart attack or perhaps lung cancer. In all three of these mere examples among plenty more that could emerge for the presentation, it is seen that the sin is associated with something that is not necessarily detrimental to the biology of the individual, except that it becomes so when it is skewed by their offered, normalized temptations. So, eating fatty meat is not detrimental, but burning it and mixing it with several types of sugars is. Having sex is not detrimental, but doing so in ways that the biology of the body is not really designed to do is. Smoking some natural herbs like tobacco is not detrimental, but mixing it with unnatural chemicals and poisons is. Therefore, the cult of sin always offers the temptation alongside the tainted object or behavior it is tempting the soul to give in to. If you do it, and then you become ill, you go to a priest of health or a doctor, who defines then your penitence. However, the main objective of this sin system is to provide a streamline of pharmakos, or ritual sacrifices of ugly sinners, so that they, in their view, feed their God and earn its favor. It seems to enjoy suffering as a main course. So the first step is to provide a diagnostic, or, in reality, a sin certificate that defines the resulting disease. This resulting disease is, of course, associated with the tainted behavior tempted by other priesthoods within this all-encompassing cult of sin. And so the next step is to define the penitence. These can be in the form of potion-taking, like pills and injections, or in more extreme sin cases, it has to be paid with a mutilation surgery or an offering of a pound of flesh, as is well depicted in Shakespeare, whoever Shakespeare really was, Merchant of Venice, a recommended read. When one of their patient dies from the torture or the penitence applied, the sin is then considered absolved and the offering of suffering entirely accepted. Since being born outside of the favor of the cult of sin's false god is also, by itself, considered the sin, the penitence has to start early by the forced taking of potions and injections from almost the very moment of birth. Now, this contemplation is just a, an attempt to merely be a presentation of a pattern by the usage of examples and metaphors. It is always up to each of you to contemplate yourselves and realize whatever needs to be realized. Words and reality are linked together, and yet we must use them to communicate. However, once the existence beyond words and reality is found, or better said, it finds us, then we have the power to know and distinguish which words in our minds we translated from that ineffable state into reality, and which words are spoken in our minds by that tentacle-like hive mind that wants our souls to be its servant. Just for a laugh, and to end on a lighter note, let me try an impersonation of Yoda. The dark side dangerous is, hmm? Remember always, you must. No words, truth speaks. <laughs>